You might think making fire from ice sounds like the impossible. But that's exactly what scientists have been able to do in the wilderness of the Arctic, as a sleeping giant begins to stir. Ground that's been frozen for thousands of years is rapidly thawing out, releasing not only prehistoric secrets, but dangerous gases on a colossal scale. Just before the plane stopped flying, I travelled to spectacular Alaska to investigate this worrying new environmental threat that has profound implications for us all. Winter in Alaska is not a time for hibernation for Professor Katie Walter-Anthony. Her days start early. And the frigid dawn temperature isn't the only chilling thing about this expedition. This is the scariest part, because uh -huh. you never know if there's a hole right in front of you. I'm glad you're ahead of me, Katie. <laughs> We're heading out onto a frozen lake, but just how frozen is the question? These days, the professor treads warily. <gasps> oh, shit. Oh! Oh. What are we going to do? Uh, I'm going to look back up. <laughs> Around here, if you don't fall through the ice, you can get blown off it. Tonight, the explosive story of fire and ice. When a giant sleeper in the climate change equation starts stirring. The Arctic is warming faster than other regions, and that means that we're seeing these changes in some faster than you would in, in other places. How much faster? Is there a way of measuring it? It's at least twice as fast. Really? Yeah, the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. It's a huge problem because what was once permanently frozen ground or permafrost, up to thousands of metres deep, is thawing out. This means all the carbon-rich trees, plants and animals snap frozen in time start to rot and create gas. So when that permafrost thaws, it's like we're opening the freezer door and we're allowing all of that carbon to start, it becomes food for microbes and it starts decomposing and it produces greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane. And we know that methane is quite potent as a greenhouse gas. That's right, methane is about 30 times stronger as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. It's estimated that a quarter of the Northern Hemisphere is covered by permafrost. And when you look out at all this frozen ground, you would think this is the last place where global warming would pose a problem. But it does. The permafrost is thawing out. And in some parts, it's melting faster than in others, like here in Fairbanks, Alaska. And this abrupt thaw has scientists like Katie Walter-Anthony racing to determine what it means for the planet. It's important to know because we think that the amount of carbon in permafrost is two times more than the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Is permafrost thaw a bit of a wild card when it comes to global warming? There are some large wild card components of it. So we have to dig through the snow to get to the surface of the ice. Mm -hmm. And then there are pockets of gas trapped in the ice. All right. So we have to spear into those. Wintertime is the perfect time to look for the methane bubbles rising to the surface. The frozen lake is pockmarked by small methane chimneys, indicated by a subtle dip in the ice. The gas is being produced all year because the bottom of the lake's not frozen. So the microbes that are down there feasting on the permafrost that's thawing, yeah. they're making methane all year round. So over the course of many months, you can get huge volumes of gas, great big pockets of gas trapped in the ice. When she first started this research, Katie was told of Siberian folklore of frozen lakes bursting into flames. It didn't take long for her team from Alaska University, including engineer Phil Hankey, to turn folklore into fact. Right there, right there yeah. 
Oh, wow. So Sarah could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> okay, let's should we try that one. Spearing through the ice is as hard as it looks. Come on. It's hard. There's no exact way of knowing how much explosive methane gas is trapped just below the surface. And it can catch you off guard. Woo! <laughs> we did it! <laughs> nice job! <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. And it's still bubbling. Yeah, it's still, there's a lot of gas down there. That's just finding its way up. So what we just saw was some methane gas that had been trapped under that lake for how long? Given the size of what we saw, I'd say that was probably maybe two weeks worth of methane right. there, maybe one week. Okay. Um, so then if you think that on a lake like this, there are thousands of these yeah. methane seeps and that's how much gas you get in two weeks. So it's producing that much year round from every seep. Yeah. And the millions of lakes in the Arctic and all of the permafrost thawing, it starts to add up to big numbers. Should we try this one? Let's try it. Woo! <laughs> well, we got to fly. Are you okay? <laughs> I'm good. I'm so that sorry. Was, I that was this beer. huge. <laughs> that was the biggest one I've ever seen. <laughs> that was the biggest one we've ever seen. But Katie's research is a lot more than pyrotechnics. Up until recently, scientists hadn't taken the methane pumping out of these Arctic lakes into their global warming calculations. Once that gas escapes, which it will, when this ice melts in a month or so, all the methane that's been trapped in here all winter is going to go into the atmosphere. And it, with, it really quickly mixes and it goes around the whole globe within a year. In a year? Yeah, so this methane from the Arctic affects the entire globe. Australians, within a year, could have these methane molecules over their atmosphere. The methane that's coming out of this lake will yes. affect people in Australia. Absolutely, because this methane can get transported to Australia. But just how much methane is belching out into the atmosphere is a huge research task given the millions of these lakes. Whatever works. Yep. <laughs> so Katie, with the help of some pretty rustic okay. scientific equipment, collects gas to take measurements and make calculations. Here's gas bubbles going into our trap. Mm -hmm. It's now estimated up to 10% of the projected global warming this century could come from the methane bubbling to the surface up here. So from just one little hole, how much methane are we getting? One little hole, that one's emitting about 25 litres a day. Wow. So what does this tell you about how much methane is being emitted what regularly? This, what this tells me is that if we don't come out in the winter and observe what's happening with these bubbles, we're going to miss the big picture, the big story. We've realized that there's five times more methane coming out of lakes than we thought there was before. Five times more. And it's because, yeah, if we, if we take into account these bubbles. And there's no way of stopping it? Well, the way of stopping it is to keep the ground frozen. <laughs> to stop burning fossil fuels. Great. It's to not let that, it's because it's a feedback. If you cause warming, then the permafrost thaws and it, it contributes more to the warming. So the way to stop it is to prevent the warming in the first place. Coming up. This was my bedroom and right there was my desk. Thaw and disorder. And it's all gone, it just collapsed in. In the midst of the big melt. All right, let's step back in time then. And the extraordinary discoveries. So that's an 18,000 year old phone. That are changing everything we know. The bacteria that had been frozen for 26,000 years came back alive again, started to reproduce. That's next on 60 Minutes. You don't have to travel far here in Alaska to see the effects of melting permafrost. This road I'm driving along used to be flat, but as the ground thaws, it's become more like a roller coaster. I'm heading to a unique facility where geologists are digging down into the permafrost to try to figure out how rapidly things are changing. And the tunnels are revealing all kinds of long buried secrets.
you found it's a good time. We're actually actively digging more tunnel right now. So okay. we'll see some of that It'll be exciting, but oh, I've got a hard hat oh, for you. Thank you. you. And I've got a flashlight for you to uh, right. identify features and whatnot. So welcome to Fairbanks, Alaska. Thank you. Thanks and, for having uh, us. And we're happy to have we're happy to have you here. All right, let's step back in time then. Great. <laughs> This tunnel was built by US Army engineers at the height of Cold War tensions with Russia in the early 1960s. But then this storage facility turned into the coolest classroom in the world. So one of the things to point out here, we've got some bones. So there's a nice, uh, that's a step bison bone right there. Just jutting out. Just sticking right out of the wall. You can Dr. Tom Douglas is a geochemist with the US Army's Cold Regions Research Lab. So that's an 18,000 year old step bison bone. It is, yeah. Can I touch that? Of course, go yeah. for it. Come on in. Oh wow, that's incredible. It is pretty neat, huh? Then over here is a step bison horn sticking right out of the wall there. Oh wow, that is very cool. Just the tip of it, and I'm not sure if there's a head connected to that or not. We've never dug it out. Oh, aren't you curious? We are <laughs> curious, but we also just, we, we've never really decided to do much uh, bone excavating. So these 18,000 year old bones of steppe bison and even the almost mythical woolly mammoth are just the start of a walk back in time. And the deeper we go, the older it gets. So another really uh, neat way to peer into the past is right here we've got well, you tell me, what does this look like? Well, it looks like grass to me. Yeah, and it's still green, right? It still has its chlorophyll. It is still green. Um, this is 24,000 years old. But this grass is still well and truly alive. It is, so partly it's been frozen for 24,000 years, so it never had a chance to rot. This truly is a unique facility. It's the only permafrost research tunnel in the world and it gives scientists like Tom the special opportunity to discover what permafrost is really made of. I work all over Alaska at, look, studying permafrost and you're almost always standing above trying to infer what's happening below you. Um, and you can dig all the soil pits you want, you can take all the cores you want, it's extremely time intensive and you almost have to happen upon things. So the fact we can go in there and just see along these walls um, thousands of years of time, but also all these different types of features that we can easily collect and survey and measure, um, there's no other place on earth to do this type of work. A critical part of this work is estimating how much carbon is down here how much ice, and just what's in it. Incredibly, bacteria unknown to science has been discovered. Interestingly, we also found that the bacteria in this ice wedge that had been frozen for 26,000 mm. years came back alive again, started to reproduce when it was brought to room temperature. You were able to regenerate bacteria from 26,000 years ago. Yeah, and so it, it, it lets you know how viable life can be in these extreme environments, <laughs> right? So you're discovering new bacteria that humans have never known before. That's right. While new bacteria could one day cause a problem, the clear and present danger to humanity yeah, now is what happens when these massive ice wedges start melting. So right now we are literally surrounded by a permafrost. Completely surrounded by frozen ground, we call it, yep. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's about as hard as concrete and everything you see in here has been frozen for tens of thousands of years. But all the infrastructure that's built on the surface above these ice wedges is at risk. If it, it is, and, and it's partly at risk even just constructing on this is very difficult. Um, but if you construct under one climate regime and things are stable mm. and it warms up into a different regime, that's where it can get kind of unpredictable. It's a whole new ball game. It is, yeah. And this has major implications for roads, cities and homes when the ice below turns to mush and starts taking everything down with it. 
You can clearly see how much the house has fallen. Oh, yeah, you You've can. Never, you had to take a step down like that before. And the house is kind of tilting over to one side over here. But it's the really big thing is over on by the lake. Bill Wetson built his dream home overlooking Goldstream Lake 20 years ago. But then 10 years ago, his lake front yard started collapsing, taking Bill's house with it. Now he's knocking it down before it falls down. This was my bedroom and right there was my deck and you can see the old fencing that's falling into the lake. That's, that's what, that's where the old fencing was. Just there? Uh-huh. And that's how much I had to take back this year. So we're standing in what used to be your bedroom right now? In my bedroom, yeah. And the deck would be out there. There'd be French doors there. You'd have a beautiful view and it's all gone now. Just <laughs> collapsed in. Bill poured his blood, sweat and tears into this place, only to see it collapse before his eyes. There's no climate change debate in this household. And this is all because of thawing permafrost? Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's just releasing all methane, which is producing even more greenhouse gases. What's it like in summer here? Do you see the methane gurgling? Yes. Surface? Oh, my gosh. You can actually hear it percolating sometimes. And you go out in a canoe and you can see the, the methane just percolating right out of the water continuously. Back down the permafrost tunnel, thawing here isn't a problem because it's kept refrigerated at minus three degrees. But Tom and his team can start to plot where to build, how to build, and really how to survive in a warming world. We've warmed about 12 degrees in the last 12,000 years. Three of those are in the last 40 years. Really? And so we're coming out of an ice age, yes, but the amount of warming has accelerated quite a bit. Uh, last year was, our, our mean annual temperature now is about minus one degree Celsius, so just slightly below freezing. Last year's annual temperature was plus 0.8 C, which is the first time in the record it's been above zero. Mm -hmm. um, and we're projected to warm four or five degrees between now and 2100. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.